I think we as humans, aside from food, food water, and, and love, we, we need a struggle. We need a challenge. Uh, if we were in a world where everything was just handed to us and we never had to work for anything, we would be so stale and stagnant, both in our spirit and physically. I think we as humans have to have that struggle. We have to have those things. It's about finding those struggles that are worthy, that are, that, that are worthy of our time and attention, that that's important, that's the key. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Blue Collar Boardroom. I've got six-time UFC heavyweight champ, the natural, Randy Couture. You may have seen him on the, the big screen. He's a successful entrepreneur with a successful MMA gym. And I've got some really big questions for this guy, man. He's a hero. Welcome to my show, Randy. Really appreciate you doing this with me, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, I'm I'm a hunter myself. Uh, I see the skins in the back. Uh, you do any hunting out there? Where Where are you at right now? I am uh, outside of Flagstaff. So you know, most people think of Arizona, they think of the desert, and Sedona, and some of those areas. But the mountains in in and around Flagstaff are pretty amazing. Uh, you know, all of a sudden you come out of the desert and you're in pine forests and uh, you know flat top mesas and all kinds of stuff. So there are a lot of animals out here. Some of the biggest elk you're ever going to see. A lot of really big mule deer. They have antelope here, and then all the other things that go with those uh, with those creatures. So it's a great place. I love it here. Yes, man, that is something about being a man. Getting out in the outdoors and forgetting about the bullshit. We live in a world full of distractions, and if I don't yeah. find myself outside, you know, getting dirty, fucking shit up, then I get I get to be a crazy motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Between uh, getting out. In the, in the outdoors and then training that's what keeps me sane that's what keeps me from from snapping <laughs> well good I, i'm going to be asking you questions about uh, a lot of things training life entrepreneurship first question is you know as a as a wrestler who made it all the way to the olympic team to a to a ufc champion to a successful gym owner to a movie star like dude where did where did you become such an entrepreneur uh, honestly, I, it wasn't, it's not like you set out to, you know, to do those things. Some, mm -hmm. Sometimes you find yourself in situations, doors open. I mean, I was a, raised in Seattle, north of Seattle in a single parent household. My mom raised three of us by herself. Um, so I think at an early age, I had an unusual level of responsibility as the only male in the house. There was the list of chores. There were things that needed to be done. And, and, and I was the one that was going to have to get that stuff done. Mom was working multiple jobs to, to try and support us. Um, so I think that developed a work ethic um, through my mother, watching her work her, her tail off and, and then, you know, transferring some of that responsibility onto me just because of the circumstance. Uh, I, you know, I got my girlfriend pregnant at 18, uh, right out of high school, uh, joined the Army. It was the only way I was going to be able to support a new family. And I wasn't going to be like my dad. Mm. I was going to be part of this kid's life. I was going to, you know, do, do my best to, to be uh, an influence on this young man. And, and, you know, my dad really wasn't that with me. So well, I think you've done a damn good job. He, uh, <laughs> from what I hear is a hell of a fighter. Thank you. That's probably a tribute to my mother. Uh, you know, she's a strong person. Um, the army shaped me. I fit. I fit in the army well. I was one of those kids already that everything had its place. My room was always clean. I was. I wasn't uh, that typical kid, or certainly that typical male child mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that tend to be, you know, throw your jacket on the floor and, and your book bag and what you know things just go willy nilly or wherever. I, I was never that way. So, entering into the army, being retaught how to fold my socks and how to brush my teeth and all these things uh, that the service taught me, attention to detail, diligence. Um, I think all those things seem to fit me very, very well. Um, and I think that's in line with a lot of the character and things I developed from the sport of wrestling. I started wrestling at 10 to get my dad's attention. Didn't work. I don't think he ever saw me wrestle one match ever, but uh, mm. you know, I found my place. My, those coaches are very important in my journey. They kind of filled that void. When I needed a kick in the ass, they were the guys to do that. And when I needed, you know, an, an, an arm around the back and, and a rub on the head, they were the guys that did that as well. So 
Um, but I just think that that sport and then the military kind of fashioned me in this mindset that, that seems to have taken me, you know, on this journey where I needed to be. Well, I'm a guy that's about squeezing the most performance out of my life. And one of the biggest reasons why I like to train in the gym is, is it just, it seems to give me energy, not just regular gym, punching shit and, and learning mixed martial <laughs> arts. It, 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 it gives me some sort of extra juice, it seems like in business. So I just want to know, like, you know, people that are looking to translate one to the other, you know, what, what is some insight that you've gotten uh, from, from training and mixed martial arts into your business and to the things that you've obviously attracted into your life? I think, uh, the guys that are going to be successful are are the guys that are willing to take the shit situation, the the tough job, and turn it into something enjoyable. Make it a challenge. Challenge yourself by doing those things that maybe some other people don't want to do, or, or you know feel like it's beneath them to to do that sort of thing. And, and I think again that you know being willing to embrace those situations and and make them fun, make them a challenge, make them fun. Uh, there's a, a probably an internal motivation to do that, but I think that that's what I see in the best athletes that I know. You know, they embrace the suck. That's what yeah. we call it. That's exactly um, what the fuck it is. You gotta, you gotta run towards contact. I feel like that sometimes people run away from the fights in their life because you know they're afraid to lose or they're afraid of what it's gonna feel like when they get hit, and then they end up running from their whole life. You know, whether that's sedating themselves with drugs and alcohol, whether that's running around doing bad things, and these contractors, they 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 constantly mess themselves up, hang themselves with their own ropes, and so you know. Uh, the biggest thing that, that, that I got from watching some of your interviews, one of the things was talking about embracing the suck. Um, in Oklahoma State, you said that you used to have to do 90-minute wrestling matches. Now, I can't even fucking fathom that 90 minutes of someone <laughs> trying to, you know, throw me around. I mean, I do it for, you know, three minutes at a time, and it's like, you know, that, I can't imagine yeah. that. So, so talk to us about that experience. I got introduced to the grind match by coach Steve Frazier. He was our national coach for Greco. This was one in the years while I was at Oklahoma state wrestling collegiate style, but I was also wrestling on a national circuit and international circuit for the national team representing the U S and coach Frazier, uh, you know, we'd have mini camps and, and stuff and you never knew what day it was going to be, but he would come in and <clears throat> say, all right, get a partner. And, and, you know, we'll give you 10 minutes to warm up clock starts, in 10 minutes get your partner and you would literally start a match and it would there were no water breaks no breaks no no timeouts no nothing for 90 minutes hmm. uh and you want to talk about find that barrier find that wall uh where your brain starts telling you you're tired and you need to quit but you have to persevere you have to push through that and push that barrier back constantly and that's a you know one of the few times i ever saw a grown man cry in a workout i mean literally it just hit that point where he, he could not make himself go anymore and he was pretty upset about it it was pretty interesting and and that ebb and flow for 90 minutes there might be part of that 90 minutes where you're kicking somebody's ass and there are a whole a whole big part of that 90 minutes where you're getting your ass kicked because you're tired i mean but you find that wall you find that barrier and, and you're constantly trying to push that barrier back so, you know, there's a David Goggins on the internet, supposed to be the hardest guy on the internet, obviously not in comparison to people like you, but, but he's, he says, you know, that the human mind, it, 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 the body is capable of doing 40% more when it, when it's time to quit, when it, when your mind, when your body says it's time to quit, there's actually 40% more you can tap into. Now, uh, tell me, you, you think that's the right number or, or how do you, how do you tap into that? Well, I, I don't know how you come up with a percentage like that or a number like that. I've met David. David, I've watched David speak. He's a very, very dynamic speaker and obviously an amazing ultra marathon athlete, a guy that has literally challenged the boundaries of, of human existence and human capabilities. Um, I like his, his comment. You don't quit when you're tired. You quit when you're done. That's when you quit. Right. So, and I, th I thought that that's one of the things he said that stuck with me that made sense, that fit my mindset for sure um you know i looked at it like <clears throat> every opponent that i came up against my job was to break them and mm. i don't mean physically hurt them or break them that way but make them work harder than they wanted to work make mm. it, find, 
I want to find out where your boundary is. Where mm. do you decide or your brain starts telling you you need to quit? That's my job. And if I'm not stepping up in that cage or out on that field with that mentality that I'm – whatever guy – I do this with football players all the time. It's, most people don't think of it as a combative sport. But it is. It is. It, 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 rules of engagement, but it, it's body on body. It's contact. It's combative. And, and like, I realize there's 10 other guys on this field, but you're keying somebody across that line every single play. And that guy better have the worst game of football he's ever had or you're not doing your job. That's the mentality I walked up into that cage with or out onto that mat every summer, every single time I competed. I want to break that guy. I want to make him quit. That's exactly and, why I'm bringing you to my conference because the ability to never quit, it translates into business. I think it's the most important skill in life. You know, I've, I've been in debt. I, I've been facing fines. I've had people leave my business and it certainly made me want to quit. And there's something about just staying in the game, just staying in there and, and just be willing to take it all. As a matter of fact, Zach Conley, he hooked us up and he read, wrote a book called Training to Win. And uh, one of the things inside the book, it really grabbed my attention. He says, when you go into a cage fight, you have to be willing to accept the worst case scenario, meaning that you get beat in front of your family and friends and, and Hell, you might even take a shit in the middle of the cage. You might get knocked silly. You don't even know. He literally wrote that in this book. It creates an image. And I'm thinking, you know, if if you are all in and you accept the worst case scenario and 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 you're never gonna quit, no nothing can stop you. You know what I mean? Do you, you know, so so talk to me a little bit about um, in life how it, being able to accept the worst case scenario and not give a fuck about what people think has been able to help you in business. Yeah, well, I think it doesn't get any more poignant than, than walking out of that tunnel and up those four steps into that cage in front of twenty to, to 50,000 people in your board shorts. There's a chance that, you know, you got things wrong and you're not going to win uh, in front of all those people. So dealing with the uh, possibility, uh, frankly, the eventuality that you're going to fail at some point, you're going to lose at some point. Everybody does. Making friends with that. Uh, the people that really matter are not going anywhere. They're not just fans, you know, and, and that's a, sometimes a burden because you're only as good as your last fight uh, with, with fans. Um, and, and, you know, we're fortunate to have a lot of gracious fans in MMA, but still, they're very critical. Uh, the people that really matter are not going anywhere, whether you win or lose. And they're the ones that count. They're the ones you do everything you do for. So, once you make friends with that possibility that, yeah, I, I've done everything I know how to do to be successful and I'm going to walk out here and there's a chance I may come up short. Uh, guess what? The sun's coming up tomorrow. The people that love me and really care about me aren't going anywhere. What else do I need? Um, and keeping that proper perspective around it frees me up to go out and show everybody what I trained to do, what I prepared for. I prepared for that night for quite a long time, did my diligence, did the work, studied the tape, had, had brought together the right guys, the tra training partners and the teammates to, to help me sharpen the appropriate tools to go out and try and solve that problem. That guy across the cage poses a problem that I have to solve. Everything we do is that way. You got, you got a job you know, to build something, that job poses particular problems. I'm trying to build a shop right here at my place. Well, about three and a half feet down is solid rock. What? Uh, salt cap. I mean, that's a problem that I have to figure out how to solve. And it's the same thing as walking up in that cage. And sometimes you get it right and sometimes you don't. And when you don't, embrace that moment because that's your opportunity to change things, to analyze what you're doing, to learn some new stuff and get your ass back out there and do better the next time. And I think uh, that... That's yeah, that's... Attitude. That's a, that's a great attitude to have. See, contractors, they're worried about going broke. They're worried about looking stupid. They won't necessarily live to their maximum performance because they're holding a little bit back. And one thing that Zach told me that you really speak about is you speak about how when you were a wrestler and you were learning jujitsu, that you had to check your ego at the door. Even though you were a uh, 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 wrestled for the United States, you, you're trying to learn MMA. Your first MMA bat, when, when was your first MMA fight? First MMA fight was uh, 
April of uh, 2000, uh, 1997, mm-hmm. uh, UFC 13, literally on a whim, uh, saw the sports, saw Don Fry, saw Mark Coleman, Dan Sever, and other wrestlers that I knew from the wrestling world that were competing in this crazy sport and, and was immediately intrigued by it. Saw the application of years of wrestling and a chance to be a professional athlete, which there really, other than professional wrestling, there is no real athletic outlet for wrestlers, guys like me. So I was lucky enough. Back then, you filled out an application. It was a whole different deal um, and was lucky enough to get in. And, and yeah, I had to learn, you know, very quickly what these jiu-jitsu guys were laying on their backs and and doing all this stuff that I wasn't used to as a wrestler. Uh, I had to figure that out. And that meant I had to put myself in those situations and risk getting tapped out, risk getting choked. You know, here's a guy who, who won multiple national championships and, and bidding for the Olympic team at the highest level in one sport in wrestling. And now transitioning to a sport like mixed martial arts where wrestling is, is a piece of it, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff to learn. I'm going to get kicked. I'm going to get punched. I'm going to get choked. Those are all things that are not allowed in wrestling. So I had to come to terms with, with taking my lumps and learning something new all over again that meant I was going to fail. That meant I was going to get beat up. That meant I was going to, there were a lot of people out there. It, it boils down to humility. I use this a lot. I start with the humility. I act with humility. I end with humility. With, with humility, I have an open mind and an open heart. Every single person I meet is better at something than I am. Amen. And with humility, I have a chance to figure out what that is, what, it, what that is and learn from that person. Uh, and so I always try to start with humility, act with humility, end with humility. It puts me in the right frame of mind to gather as much information from others as possible and, a, and find a way to make it my own. It's a good lesson for me because uh, I'm currently learning jujitsu, getting submitted. I, I do boxing and stuff and love the striking stuff because I don't get choked out. Um, but, you know, I do get the shit beat out of me from time to time. Um, I, biggest the biggest thing is is like you know uh guys that are that are trying to uh kind of do something in their life they always have to take a risk and one one of the things that you did in your career was you stood up for what you felt was right and you you left the ufc and started to have a calling to stand up for your brothers in con in in fighting so so walk me through the night that you decided to do that well, you know, it was an education process. When I first started, um, I didn't know anything about ancillary rights or what these contracts were. I didn't have a lawyer. You know, me and my, my trainer and manager at the time, Rico Ciparelli and his brother Lou, were, were trying to sort it out. And, and uh, Lou was kind of the business side of that, and Rico was more the technical training side of that. Um, but we signed some pretty crappy contracts because we just didn't know what the hell were in them. And, and then as I went down the road a few years and learned more and, and, and started, you know, I ended up eventually getting a different manager that came from the entertainment world. He started educating me on ancillary rights and what they were and, and why th- there were all these things in these contracts and what, what many of those clauses, I'm not a lawyer, but, you know, they, they were and had access to and, and basically educated me. And some of these contracts were so restrictive to take all your ancillary rights, that's your ability to write a book, do, do anything else with your name and likeness outside of stepping up in that cage and fighting. Um, and, and they were taking those from a lot of fighters in perpetuity forever. Mm. Uh, it, it was a WWE model. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of The Rock, uh, John Cena, but they have to get permission from the WWE to be able to go out and do those films and do those things because... Mm. Those ancillary rights are owned by the WWE. It's the exact same model that, that the UFC is using. And my manager, you know, when, when Dana White and the Fertitas bought the company in 2001, I had just signed with this new management team, and they literally educated me about what that stuff was. And and I'm like, well, hell, I'm, why would I sign that? I'm the, I'm the heavyweight champion of the world in this, this promotion right now. Mm-hmm. That should give me some leverage to to get a better deal, to not have to sign away all this stuff that means, you know, potentially means a lot for my future when I'm done fighting, when I can't step up in that cage anymore. And 
we started button heads with him over over those things in that contract. Uh, the uh, the upside, I en- I ended up owning all my own ancillary rights. The downside, hey. closed a bunch of those loopholes in those contracts for other fighters. Now, you know, in 1996, <clears throat> the Muhammad Ali Act was passed as federal legislation to protect boxers. I saw that. From King and Bob Arum. And uh, there was no transparency in the sport. Guess who was the athletic commissioner in who? 1996 in, in Nevada? Who's that? One of the most, uh, Lorenzo Fertitta. Oh, okay. I see how he, it works. He knew exactly what he was looking at when four or five years later, he has the opportunity to buy the brand, the UFC, the promotion. The he was looking at an opportunity not to have to pay the fighters and then to make a big income. He, he knew how he could exploit the fighters, they weren't protected under the Muhammad Ali Act. There was mm. no federal legislation. Mm. There was no transparency. So he could do pretty much what, whatever he wanted. Now, <clears throat> thank God I'm you thank- won your rights because now you're a movie star. <laughs> well, and, and I'm thankful that, that, you know, that they did what they did because the sport may have died. The guys that were running it before, uh, Bob Marowitz and, and SCG, had, had no real inclination of what the sport was and, and how to really promote it properly. For them, it was an extreme. You know, they wanted to live on that fringe. It was sensational. It wasn't a genuine sport back then. No holds barred and, and all the stuff that, that was going on. And we ran, with the Fertitta's help, ran towards regulation. Um, and running towards regulation legitimized us and made us more of a real mainstream sport. Um, and, and so have to be thankful for them for having the savvy to do that. But at the same time, recognizing that there's no reason why there shouldn't be some transparency in the sport. If I'm the heavyweight champion of the world and I fight on a card, I should know how much money was brought in from that event because that directly affects my value to negotiate my next fight and my next contract. And that's what doesn't happen in our sport. So a lot well, of fighters are being advantage of they're not being paid properly that's just the way it is and and that certainly affected me as an athlete affected my son who fought for 12 years in the sport and all the guys on my team they're all having to sign these crappy contracts and and sign away their ancillary rights and all this other stuff so that's what motivated me to kind of butt heads with them and fight over some of this stuff well when you know something's right and you don't fight from it you, there's something inside of you that dies when you walk away and what I love about you is that, you know, you're not afraid to walk away from a fight and stand up for everybody in the, I watched the testimony in front of Congress. And I just, I, I'm thinking about all the friends that you're losing all the different stuff that you're talking about your son having to come up against, knowing that all this is going to create more resistance, but you're, you're not going to stay silent. And so have you felt like that there's been any forward movement in that regard? I mean, what I think you're, I think we've seen, uh, free agency take place where guys got distraught and, and upset with what they were being paid uh, by the by the biggest promotion in the sport, the UFC, and a lot of them were fleeing to, to other promotions like Bellator. Or one now, championship or whatever. Yeah, one, uh, one has really flourished in, in Asia um, and, and doing a great job with, with a lot of the fighters over there. They're starting to pop up these other places where fighters could go to, to make a living as a, as a professional fighter um the pfl i've been working with the pfl who's you know the last couple years who've taken the mma the sport of mma and and put it into a true sports format that's been fun to be a part of and they're taking care of those fighters very very well uh they're not they're not really interested in ancillary rights other than when those guys step up in that cage and what they do in that cage when they represent the pfl um so slowly some fighters are getting a better shake. They're getting uh, a better deal or they're, they're using their leverage to get a better deal. But ultimately, and, you know, there's a big class action lawsuit going on. We just certified our classes for the UFC's business practices because they, anybody that came up like Pride, WEC, Strikeforce, that was being successful and making money, they would absorb them. They would buy them. And th- th- in a lot of ways, they created a monopoly. monopoly. Right. Uh, kind of a, a monopoly, monopsony, I think, is the other word that they right. use for that. Um, and, and, and we know how those tend to turn out. So um, the Ollie Act being amended, that's, that's why I was speaking to Congress. That's why 
we need a, you know, there's a N NBA Players Association, NFL Players Association, Major League Baseball Players Association that helps those players get a better piece of the pie for, you know, the short window that they get to be a professional athlete. We don't have that in MMA. So trying to form an MMA FA, a Fighters Association, going to the Congress to try and get the Ali Act and the definition of a boxer change to combative sports athlete. So we enjoy the same transparencies and protections that that provides for boxers since 1996. Uh, and this class action lawsuit, if it's successful, will possibly change the way that the promoters have to do business in our sport and hopefully create some transparency and, and give the fighters a bigger piece of the pie. Show me another professional sport where 13 to 15 percent of the revenues from that event go to the fighters. It brings me it brings me to a stupid subject that you probably probably pisses you off, but like, you know, the stupid Jake Paul offering fifty million dollars to Conor McGregor when he's getting paid five million dollars to fight Poirier. And he, and Conor McGregor won't even you know what I'm saying? Yeah, here's the disparaging difference between boxing and MMA, a lot because of the protections of that federal legislation that allow boxers to represent themselves, promote themselves, uh, own a you know why is Floyd Mayweather literally able to make $200 million a fight? Because he can rep represent himself and there's transparency and he knows his value in the marketplace. That's what we don't have in mixed martial arts and that's what we're trying to change. And, you know, yeah, I think the current fighters, the ones now that have skin in the game need to step up if they want to see it change at all. Um, my old retired butt is <laughs> really isn't going to help that much. Uh, I'm going to do what I can, but honestly, it's those well, guys. But, with but the you work. set the example. You got your rights. Then you went on to become a movie star. Uh, the movies are awesome. The Expendables, and 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 you got more projects coming up. And you know, so as you kind of built this new you. I mean, a lot of times people are in this world right now having to change completely. They're having to pivot. They're, they're, these times they're, they're causing people to lose jobs, lose businesses, and then they got to go work on commission. They got to build their own business. They feel like, okay, now I got to do this for myself. There's a lot of middle-aged guys that want to learn commission or entrepreneurship, but have never done it before. What's maybe some advice that you can give them? Because you went into having your gym and it was sink or swim, and then you went on to do other things in business. What, what advice do you have to someone getting into that experience maybe later in life? I think uh, like anything else, uh, like getting ready for a fight or getting ready for a big wrestling tournament or a big wrestling match, uh, you set that goal, you know where that destination is, where it is that you want to be, and then you spend the time to sit down and draw the map, those small steps along the way, each day, each week, each month, that are going to keep you on track and keep you headed towards that destination. You wouldn't go from here to Dallas without a map. What makes you think you're going to go from here to that destination and achieve that goal without drawing out a plan? And is that plan going to be perfect? No. you got to be willing to pivot, move, and, and adjust as you go and be willing to fail, fall on your ass, fall on your face a couple times. And I think embrace those adversities because they are, going to, they are what's going to keep you on track and keep you headed in the right direction. Sharing that stuff with somebody that you care about, that you trust, that has your best interest in mind, whether that's your mom, your grandpa, your best friend, whoever, so that they can steer you too. If you start getting off track or getting carried away somewhere else, which we have a tendency to do, somebody can yank your chain a little bit and say, hey, I thought you were doing this, and this was your destination. Is that really helping you get where you needed to be? You know, somebody that, that holds you accountable. There's where iron sharpens iron comes in. It's about accountability. I'm only as good as the guys I'm training with. Those are the guys that are going to tap me out, going to punch me, going to kick me, force me to learn new things, and make me sharp. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it, that's simple. So surround yourself with the right people, drawing that map to get you to that destination. It's, it's goal setting. It's, it's simple goal setting. I learned it from athletics. This is why I think athletics is so important for our kids uh, because if they're coached right and, and mentored right, they're going to learn a lot of those same skills and develop that same resilience and character that's going to translate to anything they want to do. What do you, okay, so my kids are in the boxing gym right now. They're learning jujitsu and things. I mean, so, uh, you know, I 100% I agree with you. 
Um, any advice that you have, you know, bringing kids up through the through those sports and 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 you know you you got all of your wits about you. You've been pounded on a bit. Now I'm an old guy, okay, not really, but but I'm bald just like you. I'm 35 years Good. old. And I, I love it. <laughs> I, I, I feel the gods of war summoning me. I don't give a fuck. I'm not going to be defined as a snowflake. I want my uh, destiny or, or legacy to be defined as, you know, I, I want to go fight in a cage. Zach actually inspired me just to cross it off mm -hmm. my bucket list. So um, any advice for an old man that's looking to uh, get into a cage? And, and, and when, when, you, when, when do you think you're ready for that? Well, I don't think there's any time limit. I think anybody's capable of doing it. If you put in the time, like I said, you know, set that goal, draw that map, get with the right team, the right group of people that are going to foster and help you grow and, and, and bring you along. Uh, it's never, you know, as much as it's an individual sport, walking those four steps up into the cage, it's absolutely a team sport. You try to get the best guys you can around you that have your best interest at heart. They're not trying to prove that they're better than you are. They want to see you flourish and get better yourself. Same with kids. It's got to be fun. So I see so many parents get so intense with their kids and want them to be successful that they kind of take the fun out of it. Athletics is supposed to be fun. Fighting is supposed to be fun. Yes, it's a hard made way, hard way to make a living, but it's still supposed to be fun. That's why I'm smiling, walking out to that cage where I might get my head kicked off. Uh, because that's my moment to show everybody what I train to do and how I prepare. And, and I think it's got to be fun for kids, fun and fundamentals when they're young. Make it a blast. Find different ways to have fun, make games out of it, but still grounded in those, those techniques and those fundamental skills that they need to learn. And eventually, they're going to get serious about it on their own. Mm. You're not going to have to push them. They're going to develop that genuine core passion for what they're doing and they're going to say, I want to be the best at this. And they're going to set that destination, that goal. And, and I think that it's the same as we're older. I've had lots of guys, journalists and other guys come to the gym that wanted to experience it. Because the, the truth is, you don't know what it feels like until you step up in that cage and actually do it. Um, thankfully, now there's amateur shows and competitions all across the country and around the world. You know, that, I didn't have that fortune, you know, the good fortune right. to do that. I was rallying off my wrestling experience and stayed on amateur shows back then. Now, you know, my son got seven amateur fights in before he decided it was time to, to try a professional fight. And so he could test his feet, see how he competed, find out where his flaws and weaknesses were, and try to shore those up before he got into you know, a bigger, more competitive fight. So I think that there, there are lots of guys that, that want to experience this and see what this intensity and this feeling is like. There is nothing like it. You will never feel more alive than you're standing out there in your trunks, ready to walk out in front of everybody, never more vulnerable and never more alive. You will feel every hair on your body in that moment. Oh, man, I, I, that's... That's something that you you wish for, but then you just know that that you do you are going to have to pay the price. And uh, you know, look, I created a sort of fight club with contractors about five years ago. I was frustrated with my business. I was living in a little bit of anxiety and stress and disappointment. wasn't maximizing my performance, and I felt it. I was burnt out. And so I actually uh, started coaching other contractors, and I realized, man, these guys I'm coaching teach me a lot of shit. And you know, after coaching for five years. 700 guys they taught me a lot of stuff and you know i started hiring coaches five years ago and so i'm not a product of me i'm a product of my dad and my uncle coaching me i'm a second generation contractor all my coaches and all the people i coach and i think there's a saying that you always need some person to mentor you always need some person to compete with and you always need people that are getting uh that you're, that you're getting mentored from. You're going to mentor somebody, get more mentorship, and compete with it. And I feel like I get extra luck in life. The more people I mentor, the more people that look up to me as a mentor, and the more people I'm competing with. You know, because, you know, it, the, the more that you add to that, the more luck that you seem to create for yourself or energy that you manifest in life. And I guess my biggest question is, is, do you, do you believe in the law of attraction? And do you think some of your, your championship moments where you were able to visualize success and, and 
you know, there's this guy, Dr. Joe Dispenza. He talks about the feelings of the future, of how you can anchor, you know, a positive thought with feelings. And I just think about championship moments in my life. Sometimes I can give myself goosebumps. But how, how, how did that visualization do, and that law of attraction work for you in both fighting and then into becoming a movie star and creating these awesome opportunities where you're getting paid without having to get the shit beat out of you? Yeah, well, I, I agree 100%. I think we as humans, aside from food, water, and, and love, we, we need a struggle. We need a challenge. Uh, if we were in a world where everything was just handed to us and we never had to work for anything, we would be so stale and stagnant, both in our spirit and physically. I think we as humans have to have that struggle. We have to have those things. It's about finding those struggles that are worthy, that are, that, that are worthy of our time and attention, that, that's important, that's the key. Uh, visualization is a huge thing for me. I believe in the law of attraction. I think what you put out there, that some people call it an aura, some put a vibration, whatever. We all, everything, this table vibrates. Uh, and, and what you put out there is what you're going to get back. And so if you're positive and, and you're setting goals and you're treating people right and doing the right things, you know, that's the kind of people you're going to attract. It uh, doesn't mean that there are other people, especially as you become more successful, aren't going to be drawn to you too, but for different motive, motivation, right? They, everybody has an angle. Ironically, um, so it, it, ironically, it was Dana recently on a, some shit I was watching and said, look, dude, the one thing about success is you can never get away from the negativity and haters. And you just, it's just, it's just, so how, what's, what's your advice on dealing with negativity? I mean, uh, or haters. Age. I, I, we, we can all step behind that little voice we have in our head. I call him my crazy roommate because he says things to me that nobody in their right mind would really say, but, but it will undermine your confidence and, and often run in with that little, the, we all have that self-talk, most of us, that, that subconscious voice. Recognizing that you control that voice, that voice does not control you. I can step behind that voice anytime I want and let it chatter on and say what all that, what, you know, whether it's about me or somebody else or whatever it is, it'll go on and on and on. It's taking in all these bits of information. I get to choose when I step forward and engage in what I engage in. And for the haters and, and the, the people out there that, that want to see you fail or want to step on you on, on their way up, uh, you just don't engage. I, don't, I, don't, I get to choose. I, I choose who and what I engage in. I choose to engage with positive people and positive things that are going to move me forward. And get me where I want to go. Um, Amen. I love that. It's a huge thing. Seeing you can see success in your mind, you, just like watching a movie. I can I can close my eyes and I can see every one of those fights. I fought that fight a hundred times before I ever walked up in that cage. I visualized it up a hundred different ways. With that one common denominator, I always saw my hand getting raised at the end of it. God, I love that shit. Last night I was doing rows and my wife came outside. She was like, what the fuck is going on here? And I said, <laughs> I'm beating people up. Leave me alone. And, uh, you know, my whole point is, is that um, it's really, it's really weird. This, uh, you know, whenever you're not pushing yourself to the extreme physically, how mentally you kind of start to fall apart. And in life that we're in right now, businessmen, we're always thinking about just making money. Sometimes we forget about our fitness. We forget about our, our spiritual condition and, 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 and being sane. And a lot of contractors, they struggle, like I said, drugs, alcohol, and other things. And, you know, what I'm going to do is, is I'm actually going to invite these guys to participate in some of the workouts that I've been doing, offering them a virtual home boxing setup. And I partnered with my boxing coach. We're going to be selling them uh, an app and an online university for them to, to learn and work out from home. And then we're going to give them the chance to come and meet up for live events down here in South Florida so they can, they can put the gloves on. They can check it off the list. They can get in there and spar a little bit. And uh, all the haters and negative people out there talking, oh, they're invited too. They can pay the price. They can come on Step Up. There's no, there's no problem with that. So we're calling that the Contractor Fight Club. And I'm certain that this is going to make it to the Discovery Channel, showing contractors competing to win business and then beating the shit out of each other. What do you think about that concept for a TV show? I, that sounds pretty interesting to me. Yeah, uh, just just regular old Joes. I mean, sometimes I'll go through YouTube and watch these idiots fighting each other on YouTube and stuff. Like, you know, whether it's a boxing match or something in the hood. And you're, you're just watching two amateurs, but it's not really the people in the UFC obviously doing things at the highest level, but it's entertaining to some extent. So, uh, sure. And again, I, I think we need that, that physicality, that struggle. There has to be a balance. 
if, if one side or the other gets, if it's all cerebral and sitting at a desk and working and all that, that's not healthy. That's not good for you. And if it's all just, you know, physical, that that's, that's probably not healthy for you either. You need to find that balance where you're, you're checking all those boxes. Yeah, the balance of the last the last guy I was in there sparring with, he has three fights. He he rang my bell for three days. I still got a busted up rib, and I'm thinking, uh, is it worth the trade off? And it absolutely is because I mean, yeah. you know, the truth is, is like it takes a few days, but just the energy that you get from saying, hey, I did that. I I, I you know, because Sean, the guy that got me in the ring, he he he's the one that dragged me to the boxing class, dragged me to the MMA, and said, you need to do this. This is gonna be good for you. And uh, now that I can get in there and just at least stay alive, you know, it's 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 one of those things I, I wrote down as a goal from the very beginning. But uh, you know, I, I the reason why I brought you here, like Zach, he inspired me to do that. His book, Training to Win, he wrote the book. You know, it 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 really did. It inspired me to to create more of a physicality to 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 balance out my uh, too much of that you know softness. We have a generation of, of distracted snowflakes, and I felt like I was becoming. Uh, too much of one of those guys and uh you know i mean bottom line is is kids made fun of me when i was a kid for doing karate i can remember doing karate loving to go into the sparring tournaments and shit i should have fucking kept it up uh, mma it came later on in my life i was it would have been really helpful from the ages of fucking 20 to 30 years old just having something positive in the gym but you know yeah. now i'm 35 years old i'm saying it's not fucking too late and um you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do what it takes to, to, to get myself ready. And I think the pressure of when someone will, if you don't train, that someone will kill you in front of people, um, that makes you train harder. And boxing or, yeah, you know, going to the going to a regular gym, just pumping weights or, or going to play basketball, there's no, like, adrenaline. Like, they say that flow or this that is it from ad adrenaline junkies get it from the the chance that you could get hurt, you could die, but you could also have, you know, a great experience where a champion. Yeah, so how, how tell, tell me. Um, What's that? Go ahead. You, you got better sound now. What were you saying? You need, that, you need that little bit of fear. Any fighter that tells you they don't have a little bit of fear walking up into that cage or signing on the dotted line to say, yeah, I'm going to fight that guy is a sociopath or they're lying. We all have that little bit of fear. That's what motivated motivates us to do the work, that fear of failing, but you still, you can't get so wrapped up in that fear that you don't go out and perform that you don't use the gifts and the things that you work to do. And I think that applies to just about everything. There, there is always going to be that little bit of fear that's healthy. And you need to embrace that, keep that proper perspective that we talked about around that situation, and go let it hang out. Hell yeah, man. So tell me about lessons of growing your gym. You got one of the biggest MMA gyms, famous MMA gyms in Las Vegas, and a, a fight team. You know, what are the you know, business secrets? I'm actually about to open a, a gym with my a second gym with my boxing coach and you know give me some insight on 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 launching your gym and and things that that, that were keys to your success i think key, keeping it simple and making it about family you know like he's like you said we attract through that law of attraction we attract like-minded people people that have the same values and and, uh, and the same perspective in life and and so and they become your family. Once that person comes in the door and you get a chance to spend some time, sweat, bleed, and work with them, you get to know them, those walls come down, and there's a connection there that you can't, you, you, you can't replace and you can't explain maybe sometimes. It becomes a brotherhood, a family. Um, and, and so I, you know, there, there's not a more competitive MMA gym market in the, in the U.S. than there is in Vegas. Mm. There's a lot of big MMA gyms in Las Vegas. It's the epicenter for the sport in a lot of ways. I, I didn't care what anybody else was doing. It wasn't about what they had in their gym or who they who they were training with or what they were doing. It was about us and, and figuring out the best way for us to continue to push each other, make each other better, and move forward. That was my family. And, and my son Ryan and, and Eric Nixick have done a great job when I retired the gym went through a little lull. I wasn't in there grinding out camps anymore. I had new trainers. A lot of the fighters scattered other places uh, to train. Um, 
and my son and Eric and Dennis Davis that have rebuilt that that place and again created that family atmosphere that brotherhood in there uh, you attract guys guys want to come they want to be part of that they want to feel that support they want to be pushed and at the same time nurtured and taken care of the great tip man in family in business I mean I'm my dad's my partner in business all my people, they're like family. My customers are like family. Andy Frisella, a, a leader on the internet, he talks, he's a big culture guy, and he talks about treating everyone like family. Great business tip. You're an awesome business coach. Um, you know, you've dealt with some setbacks in life before. You've lost fights or you've gone through different trials with your personal life. Um, tell me about picking yourself off the mat, not being too hard on yourself, and how to get over failure. Yeah, that's that's the biggest challenge. We're our own worst critics, and again, it's that self-talk, that that subconscious voice. A lot of times, that will can be overwhelming, especially when the pressure's turned up. Mm. Uh, you know, if I if I didn't learn to control that self-talk and that voice, sometimes the week of, of the fight, he starts freaking out. Oh man, what if I get tired? What if he does this? What if he? Do I can't control any of that. So getting it to shut up, saying stop. And then early on, I had to write write those affirmations, those positive things for that match or that tournament out on a card and recite them, put them in my gym bag, put them in my locker, put them on the mirror in my bathroom. So when I get up in the morning and brush my teeth, I'm seeing those affirmations and those things I want that crazy voice to say. You know, it starts this other stuff. I, I literally say stop and then recite what the it positive. is I want him. And pretty soon, my conscious mind and my subconscious mind are speaking the same language. They're saying the same things. Ironic Ironically, uh, you're talking about uh, things that you know Zen Buddhists talk about. This are you, are you into meditation at all? I mean, do you do any of that? Uh, I think the visualization exercises we're talking about doing, where I'm visualizing that fight. I used to do this every day after practice, lay on the mat in my own sweat, no place more, you know satisfying than after doing all that work and visualize that match visualize those techniques i was sharpening and how i saw them executed and fitting into that fight i know what that arena looks like i know what trunks i'm wearing i generally know what my opponent looks like i can see that just like watching a movie and i'll watch it happen in several different ways as many different ways as you can think of again with that common denominator i'm successful i get my hand raised at the end and now i've had a physical response to those pictures I consciously put in my head and everybody's what do you mean you have a physical response to those well I, I mean, there's a little exercise we'll do sometimes at seminars if you close your eyes and you start visualizing a lemon and you can see that lemon clearly the yellow skin the dimples on the ends and now see your hand come in and slice that lemon in half you see the two segments open up you can see the pulp you can see the clear yellow juice running out on the counter. And you can start to smell that lemon. And now what happens? You taste it. You, your, your mouth waters. You just had a physical reaction. You see any lemons anywhere where you're sitting? Mm -mm. There are none here either, but my mouth started watering. Mm -hmm. that, that physical reaction. You have the same physical reaction to those pictures you put in your head in preparation for a physical engagement. Ironically, Ed Milet, he is a big buff guy. He's going to love meeting you. He's one of my coaches. He talks about anchoring your thoughts with physical. And it's like when you're putting those visualizations into your brain while you're doing the workouts or after you're doing the workouts, I mean, there's something about, you know, while, while you're lifting or while you're running, seeing, you know, your future and, 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 and something about being able to create that, like, feeling in your body after you've done it while you're moving I and mean, do you believe there's any truth that that physical physical activity combined with that mental is it is it is a key to harnessing some of that power i yeah i think it, again getting everything in sync getting your conscious brain in sync with your subconscious brain and then your physicality what it is your your physical movements are i think all those things have to flow yeah sometimes when i'm training or i'm learning new technique i can go into i done the visualization exercises so much i can go to that place and visualize that new technique it helps me learn it faster and develop it quicker i see myself executing it in my mind as i'm being taught and we're going through those physical motions um 
It's fucking awesome, dude. And any businessman, any salesperson, anybody that's out there trying to build wealth and live their purpose can use this same advice to get whatever you want in life. As long as you're willing, as long as you're willing to go through hell, take your lumps, check your ego at the door, be humble enough to learn from everybody, every human being that comes across your path. In my belief, God sent there, you know, and, and I'm not extremely religious, but I will say like, you know, Jesus, he wasn't worried about the crowd. He was worried about his disciples. He was worried yeah. about the small group of people. And one thing that I see that's very, very strong about you is that you don't care about the crowd as much as the, as, as the small group of people that are your family. And, you know, I mean, the bottom line is, is that you're willing to stand up and fight. And, you know, that's why I invited you to this conference. It's that, you know, in order to get to these moments that anybody wants, you are going to have to fight the good fight. Uh, otherwise, you're going to end up, the one thing Ed Milet says, another speaker at the event, he says that, you know, when he dies, that he's going to meet the perfect version of himself at heaven's gate. And he wants that person, the guy that maximized his potential, to be the exact same guy that he is. And he does not want to meet that guy and say, dude, you could have made a bigger impact. You could have helped more people. You could have been better here. You could have been better here. And for me, I don't care what kind of fucking hell I have to go through. I want to maximize my performance on this earth. I'm a speck of dust, a nobody, a nothing. And I just want, maybe it's an ego thing, to be remembered and to help enough people that you know my legacy carries on for generations. And so I hope that you know that your message is going to be very impactful for, for people's body, mind, spirit, to help them win the war with themselves. It's going to inspire them, hopefully, to take action more physically. Um, you know, it wasn't even a few years ago that I was still smoking cigarettes. You know, that was the first step for me, getting rid of the cigarettes, you know, uh, going to the gym. Now, immediately a new, new me, a new vision of me started happening. And, you know, from that, you know, a lot of changes have happened in my life, but I can tell you I'm the happiest I've ever been right now. I'm probably not doing as much work, not as dedicated as much to the, to the grind or distraction of who's got my money. I find myself visualizing beating people up and dodging punches in my brain. It distracts me <laughs> from the fucking stinking thinking and ha having some of that stuff in your life ain't such a bad thing. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I think, you know, it's my journey, part of my journey to share this with entrepreneurs, whether they can call us amateurs or weekend warriors, we don't give a shit. We, we just want to squeeze the maximum amount of our potential, our chi. And, you know, whenever you talk about law of attraction, dude, don't think that there's some kind of coincidence that Randy went on to star in these movies. Now talk to us about that. You know, the, you, these movies have gone off. Your career has gone off. How do you transition? How do you how do you start being vulnerable, sharing your emotion? Because I think contractors, believe it or not, we live in a world where everyone has to start building a personal brand. They have to start sharing their who they are, being vulnerable, whether it's on social media or it's on their websites. And so I'm encouraging people to do these things, but they're afraid. They're they don't they're just like you're afraid to go into a cage fight. They're afraid of someone calling them names on the internet or looking stupid or someone saying, "Hey, you're a, you're a braggadocious guy. You're, you're you're not being humble." You know, and mm -hmm. and so going into an act as an actor, you have to kind of like. It's not the same. I mean, how how did you how it, did you make that change? It, it is a weird thing. I mean, I've spent my most of my life as an athlete, boxing up my emotions and putting them to the side, and staying laser focused on on the task at hand, and doing what I trained to do. Um, and now in acting, you know, they want you to let those emotions out and be able to to find a way to relate to a character and tell the truth. That's what acting is. If you're just trying to act and pretend to be somebody else, it's not going to sell. It's not going to work. Um, so you have to gen, you know, genuinely kind of dig into your own stream of experience and find a way to relate to that character, even though that character is going to say and do things on screen that you would never do in your real life. You still have to find a way to relate to his motivation and who he is and why he's doing these things from, from your own experience. Uh, that's been the trick. That's been Part of the process of trying to find a character it's not something i ever did in my life or ever saw myself doing in my life uh athletics opened that door they were looking for authentic cage fighters in the movie cradle to the grave this was back in 99 i think yeah that's a good I, movie and me chuck and tito all got the call to, to be in that fight scene a five-minute fight scene in that movie an underground fight scene and they wanted some authentic 
MMA fighters for it. And so that was kind of my first real time on a big set, seeing the magic. See, it's like going to Oz and seeing the guy pulling the levers to make all the smoke and fire. Uh, it, it's a, I don't know, it was, it was an eye-opening thing and something that I was immediately attracted to because it was so far outside the box for me as an athlete. Uh, and again, I saw it as a challenge. Uh, I saw it as something, you know, I was still in the heat of competition, so fighting and, and MMA always came first. Um, acting jobs kind of worked around those. When I retired in 2011 from fighting, I could focus 100% on improving my skills and getting better acting jobs. And, uh, and that's been fun. Um, I've enjoyed that journey and that process. And I feel like every time I put myself out there, I get a little bit better. I learn a little bit more on how to portray a character, how to do some of this stuff and, and how to kind of be involved in this whole magical thing that is making a movie. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's also maximizing your performance. Cause here's the thing in order to make change, you got to kill the old you to become the new you. What I see is that Randy has killed the old him many times and that there is nothing outside of your potential whether it's entrepreneurship, letting letting your, your your emotions out there on camera, or or beating someone in a cage, and that that's the reason why you know it's really going to be an incredible story at this event. Uh, you dude, you don't realize how many people are just so pumped up to see you. I mean, contractors out there, you're a hero to all of them. And I saw an interview about four uh, four years ago. I think you you had to make the decision. I think that your whole career you wanted to fight um, the. the Delph, what was his name from? I'm Beto, Beto yeah. Million. And, and and then and then afterwards, about he, you had the opportunity to, but you had to walk away from it because you were focused on being retired. Is that right? No, I, I uh, it was the one fight. You know, there's rankings, and and at the rankings at the time, I was the heavyweight champ for the UFC. He was the heavyweight champ for Pride. They had him ranked number one in the world. They had me ranked number two in the world. I'm like, I want to be number one. You want to be the best at what you do. I said, that's the guy I want to fight. You know, you guys find a way to make this fight happen. Well, they, that's Zufa in the UFC. They eventually, they tried. They, they couldn't come to terms uh, for their own particular reasons. The fight wasn't going to happen. Um, I was frustrated with the way things were going with them. They, they weren't being honest with me about a lot of things. Um, <clears throat> and so... I was going to go find a way to make that fight happen myself. What do you think uh, about this guy uh, Bass creating his own league? He's got his own deal going. You see that karate combat thing? That thing's that, it's a uh, little a little out there. Oh. What's that? Boss Root. Yeah. Boss Root. Yeah. yeah I, Boss is a great guy. He's a very smart guy. Um, he's an amazing technician. I, I've worked with him a bunch. Him and I were commentating together in the PFL for a while. He, he's just he's one of my favorite people. He's got this infectious energy that there's well, I, no escape. he's a he's a salesman i mean the way that he's able to sell his inf, his product and dude he yeah I, he reminds me he's got a lot of that i got a lot of that inside of me like that that salesiness people don't like it some people but you know that's all right join the contractor fight club come knock me out um <laughs> <laughs> anyways uh randy I don't want to keep you any longer, dude. This was an epic interview. I'm super grateful. Guys, if you watch this, Randy is going to help you win the war with yourself. He's going to help you, you know, face the facts. Stop running away from the fights. Get in the best physical, mental, and spiritual condition and start visualizing championship moments, doing the work that it takes to get there. And one of the things that, you know, was really, really, we didn't harp into it, but think about how many coaches this man has had. How many coaches in your – what is coaching and and, and, and c c where would you be without coaches? Yeah, I think having my own mentors, like you mentioned, and then mentoring others. I learned and became a much better athlete, a much better wrestler, and eventually a much better fighter because I was forced to put myself out there and coach. I know a lot of top athletes that don't know how they do what they do. They just do it. They're naturally gifted. And you force those guys to go out and teach a kid to, to go to a camp, teach a seminar. And now they have to figure out how to break that down and articulate that and hand it to somebody else. I learned more from those coaching experiences working with other athletes than I think I did certainly as I got older uh, from my own coaches. Um, and I think that's an important part of the journey is put yourself out there. Try to teach somebody else how it is you do what you do. That's going to force you to, to 
assemble it together and, and be able to articulate it to somebody else and have it make sense. And that's a huge step in, in figuring out how it is you got where you're at. Dude, it's absolutely the secret. I mean, uh, let me just replay this real quick. You know, about five years ago, I'm coaching nobody. I'm coaching the people in my business. I'm coaching some people close to me, but I'm not coaching other contractors. My dad, he's like, what do you mean you're going to create a university to help roofers? They're the competition. What are you going to do? Why are you doing that? And I'm like, bro, just let me do me, man. Just let me do me. This is what we're going to do. And he let me do me. And I've heard you talk about your son, Ryan. My dad was like that for me. He, he let me go. He let me have my room. He let me made my mistakes. And he, you know, he guided me and he coached me every time I asked for help. He told me that I was being a dumbass when I was being a dumbass, but he never got in the way. He never said, you're not going to do this. And, uh, you know, out of being able to coach all these people, you know, dude, I've gotten best practices from a lot of folks. I've been able to master my own concepts better by having to write books, build roadmaps, create courses. And, you know, that's why at this event, if you're a contractor and you want to scale, look, we're not just getting results for ourselves. We're getting results for other contractors, unlike anybody else. And a lot of people are afraid to have a live event in this climate, but look, man, um, we're coming together at the fountain blue. There are precautions, but the truth is, is that you can't be afraid. All you got to do is realize that it's the American dream that's at stake, that you need to future proof the growth of your business. If you're not where you're at physically, if you're not where you're at with your sales or your marketing or with your team, break away to make a breakthrough. Come, come meet a heavyweight champion. Come meet a legend. Come, come, come learn from entrepreneurs and, and, and take championship insight from Randy, apply it to your business. Maybe you apply it to join our contract contractor fight club. Um, all this happened because of your friend, Zach. And I just want to say shout out to Zach Conley and his book training to win. Very grateful for that. You know, he told me that he was training with you before the, uh, the, the first, uh, uh, UFC. What was that? You, you shared on your Instagram, the, the, uh, UFC fight camp. What was the name of the show? I forget. I'm retarded. Ultimate fighter. Yeah. You were the first episode of the ultimate fighter and, you know, Zach got hurt right before, but, uh, you know, he, he still is out there inspiring other people through through what he what he learned in the cage fight applied to business. He you know, he became a salesperson, applied it to business and you know, he's helped me a lot. So he's he's got you to the event. He spoke at the event last year and uh, man, we're honored to have a legend, man. This is gonna be great. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. I look forward to it. All right. Well, um guys, click the link below inside the comments, get your tickets. You can get Randy, Bradley uh, Myron Golden, Ed Milet, uh, some successful eight-figure contractors. So come to network. Come, come to be humble, to learn from everybody. You can learn from the small guy in the room, the big guy in the room, and, and, and just come for iron sharpening iron. Uh, man, what a great lesson today for me. And, uh, you know, thank you, Randy. You really continued to spark that, 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 that god of war inside of me saying, dude, you can do it. Don't be afraid. Just go out there and, and, and look, there's a lot of people out there love to see me get knocked the fuck out, but I'm going to give them that chance. So, <laughs> um, man, I appreciate you, buddy. Awesome, man. Thank you All very right. much. Thank you. Have a good one.